Hello, I'm Doug Musio. This is City Talk. Money. It's the root of all evil. It's the mother's milk of politics. It probably can't buy you love, but it can buy you office. It talks. And in the 2014 elections, money talked, and dark money did much of the talking. Here joining us again to talk money and politics is Ian Vanderwalker, counsel to the Brennan Center for Justice's Democracy Program, where he works on voting rights. Ian has produced a number of studies on campaign money, particularly dark money in U.S. politics. Prior to joining the Brennan Center, Ian served as a legal fellow at the Center for Reproductive Rights, where he litigated constitutional cases in state and federal courts across the country. Welcome back. Thank you. And, and also, thank you and the Brennan Center for shining your light on the dark. Money certainly talks. How much money did the talking in 2014? Well, we look at the uh, across all federal elections, there was about uh, almost four hundred uh, billion dollars. Uh, sorry, four billion dollars. Uh, in, in That's uh, bad enough. <laughs> four hundred billion, man. That'd be a lot. Four, four billion. Four billion dollars across all elections. Most expensive election cycle in American history. The most expensive midterms, yes. The most expensive congressional elections, including twenty twelve. So, and you saw, you know, records broken. North Carolina race beat a hundred million by. Uh, a the lot, Hagen, the tell race. us right, $111 million for a Senate race right, in we, North Carolina. <laughs> yes, exactly. Um, and and, and uh, several other races beat in, in the Senate re beat the previous record for outside spending. That right. is spending by anybody other than the candidates. So actually, and actually candidate spending went down a little bit from 2012. So with spending going up a little bit, candidate spending going down a little bit, a bigger piece of the pie are these outside groups, the interest groups. So you have, in a sense, a, a fundamental shift in the nature of campaign financing going on over the last couple of cycles, and prospectively that's to 16 and beyond. Right. The, the candidates have less control over the campaigns themselves. They're, they have less control over the message. Um, and, and more of it's being sort of ceded to these outside groups, although there's still a question about how much the candidates control the outside groups, although uh, nominally they don't. Well, I mean nominally, but you don't have to be a, a genius to figure out that your former boss thinks this way right. and strategizes that way. So there doesn't have to be explicit uh, coordination. I mean, just in many ways, simple political common sense should get you coordinated. Yeah, that's right. I mean, the, the, the system that we have now is created by the Supreme Court, which said in Citizens United, this outside spending is fine. It doesn't have any corruption concerns because it's independent. The candidates don't control it. They don't benefit from it. They have no idea what's going on over there. But we've seen the reality come up where, uh, as you said, the outside groups are run by former staff. Uh, they use the same political vendors. They use the same strategies. They even use the same footage in their ads some of the time. So this, this idea that the Supreme Court thinks these groups are independent can be questioned. You're being very euphemistic and lawyerly, as you were the last time. Let's <laughs> let's look at the Roberts Court because the two Roberts key Roberts Court decisions, the 2010 Citizens United and the 2014 McCutcheon decisions, have really transformed American politics. The court itself is pro money, and really is what is it seven? campaign finance decisions and all seven have either gutted or certainly loosened the law. Talk about the court's actions and its majority argument in this 5-4 split court. Right. The court has uh, consistently struck down common sense campaign finance regulations. And I mean, I think the only way to look at what they're doing is that they're protecting the rights of the richest people to spend the most money on elections. Um, and they say that that's uh, free speech, but, but they're ignoring the, 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 the constitutional values, the First Amendment values in having a functioning democracy, a democracy that works for everyone. Right now, we're moving towards a democracy where certain people get listened to, 
by the government and by policymakers, and everybody else is left out in the yeah, but, but Is that any different than 1776, 1788, 1860? <laughs> People have always been left out of our democracy. The difference is for 200 some years, we've been moving toward a more inclusive version of democracy. We gave women the right, right to vote. We, did, we got rid of po property uh, requirements. Um, uh, gave formerly enslaved people the right to vote. Now, for the first time, the Roberts Court is moving us in the other direction, with weakening uh, voting rights protections on the one hand and weakening campaign finance regulations that protect the ability to ev of everybody to engage in the process on the other hand. What is the legal principle behind the court's decision in Citizen Union? And then we'll move to the McCutcheon case. Well, Citizens United says that United, uh, 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 corporations have the right to spend uh, in elections, essentially. Um, but, but more important than that was the reasoning behind it, which was, was there were essentially two prongs to it. One was because uh, outside spending is independent of candidates, we don't have to worry about corruption. If an outside spender spends $10 million to get somebody elected, as long as they're not giving that money to the candidate, there's no corruption concern, so it's okay. So that's personal corruption rather than ignoring systemic corruption. Right. I mean, the, yes, yes, Go ahead. exactly. And then the other prong was, look, it's okay that, that this, these massive amounts can be spent outside because it'll all be disclosed. It'll all be transparent. You'll know about it. If so-and-so uh, owes favors to some special interest that spend outside to elect them, at least you'll know about it. And well, we that was the, the Kennedy uh, argument in his writing of the majority opinion, right. that it would all be transparent. Right. The, has he, the, is there any indication that he's rethought this by looking at the world and it's not transparent? Uh, Does that change his vote? There's no indication, but of course, I mean, he doesn't give interviews about what he thinks right. about upcoming cases, so right. we won't know until a case goes up. But this court hasn't been notable in terms of its logical consistency, in terms of cited legal principle on these cases. The problem with these campaign finance cases specifically is that the court tries to decide them in a vacuum. Citizens United had no factual record. The, the, the parties didn't get a chance to sit down and say, look, outside spending is corrupting, and here's why. Here's the facts to show that. So, so these cases go up without the facts there, which allows the court and Justice Kennedy to make these broad pronouncements about independent spending can't possibly corrupt because it's independent without uh, uh, addressing the reality of it. Hopefully, uh, in the future, we'll see legislative activity that will develop those facts, and in the next case that goes up, we'll have a factual record to show what we've seen in the past, which is this corrupting effect. Okay, let's let's go to the, the April McCutcheon decision. And, and for the first time in that decision, the court struck down federal contributions limits. Talk about the impact of McCutcheon overlaid with Citizens United. I mean, it's 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 a, it's yet another way of of giving rich people greater rights to influence elections. Essentially, the previous the aggregate limit at, at issue in McCutcheon was one hundred twenty three thousand dollars per two year cycle. Uh -huh. So the good news is now uh, after McCutcheon, we all have the right to spend one hundred twenty three thousand more than one hundred twenty three thousand dollars. <sighs> Thank you. I've, wait a second. Hold on. Pocket change. Go ahead. Exactly. Um, and the court reasoned there that, look, there's no corruption worry here if, if somebody spends, because the, the $5,200 per candidate limit is still in place. So in order to reach that $122,000, you have to spend you know, on, on a, a few dozen candidates. Right. Um, the problem the court doesn't recognize is, number one, these money is often aggregated through congressional leadership. So after McCutcheon, somebody can write a $3 million check to, uh, for example, John Boehner's leadership committee uh, or Harry Reid's leadership committee. And then that money will go to dozens of other candidates. Right. But didn't it buy, presumably buy a lot of influence with the leader who you wrote, you wrote out the check to? Right. And? Well, uh, the, the court doesn't, simply doesn't address it. It doesn't point. address it, doesn't, it at all. It doesn't think that's compelling. What struck me about reading the decision, because I actually read it, is, is Justice Roberts arguing that ingratiation and access embody a central p feature of democracy. So the court is giving imp an imprimatur to access buying. 
Yeah, it's, it's shocking. It's a vision of democracy that I think is not shared by the vast majority of, of Americans and is, and is really disturbing to people. The court really does say if you can spend more and you can get a senator to take your phone call afterwards, that's democracy. And I, it's just kind of a jaw-dropping vision of, uh, of, of democracy. I mean, maybe that's a, 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 a perhaps an accurate statement of the empirical reality as it is. But as a statement of normative value, that this is the way it ought to be, and that's implicit in the statement, that's pretty disturbing. Right. And I think that the, the government should have the ability to... Um, sort of counteract, look, rich people can buy the best of everything. They shouldn't be able to buy the best government. Um, so there should be this one place where we say elections, democracy, this is where we're all represented. This is where we're all equal. And the court is just moving in the opposite direction. Okay, let's look at the, the impact. You talked about nearly $4 billion in total campaign spending. The Republicans uh, it, it seems had about a hundred million dollar advantage in, in, in all of this. You have the race in North Carolina with Tillis and, and uh, Kay Hagan, $111 million. Heading to 2016, this, this is an arms race. You're going to talk about, what, a six, seven billion dollar presidential cycle? I, it's good. It's definitely going to shatter a lot of records. It's going to be amazing. And, you know, I, there may be changes afoot. I think the vast majority of the spending is on TV. People are starting to Still. think maybe TV doesn't really move the needle as much as people used to think it did. Um, maybe we need to work more on organizing, mobilizing, get out the boat. Those things cost money, too. But um, it's definitely an arms race, and that's the problem. Yeah, the candidates say, the other guy's got TVs, they got ads on TV every night. I can't give up. I can't stop. And right, it just right. It's, it's, it's got to it's escalate. And also, one of the things in your report, your outside spending and dark money and toss-up Senate races, certainly suggests that what you have is that the ads explode and they're meaner. They're more negative. They're just going through your report, sort of the, the lies, the damn lies, the, the, the misrepresentations are jaw-dropping, and there it goes. Right. I mean, that, you know, I think there's a lot of reasons to think our democracy is not well served by vast amounts of money being spent on TV ads that are often, you know, of questionable veracity and... Do they inform voters? Is anybody really informed by another ad saying, you know, so-and-so voted for Obamacare? Um, I think there are better ways to, 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 to have informed voters and to have engaged voters. Right. And I think that, that, that we could have policies like public funding that incentivizes certain activities by the candidates and the parties that could, add, that could help us move in those positive directions. Okay. Times editorial. Dark money helped win the Senate. Yes. Well, <laughs> it's always hard to say what changed. Go ahead. Uh, I mean, oh, the, you know, winning has many parents and yes, losing is, you know, is an right. orphan. We understand that. There's no, you know, single cause to all this. But look, the fact is the candidates that won in the competitive Senate races, overwhelmingly Republicans, had way more dark money behind them than the Democrats. They had something like 70 percent of the outside non-party outside spending in their favor was from dark money groups. So they're they're going into office with tens of millions of dollars supporting them that we don't know where it came from. Would they have lost those elections without that spending? I sort of doubt it. These are right. red states. You know, right. the Democrats were playing defense here a lot. But the, the, the fact is, now they potentially owe people favors, and the voters don't know who those people are. Right, and also the Senate changed hands. Right. I mean, the whole structure of power at the, the, the Senate level changed dramatically. One thing that struck me, I don't know if, if you were aware of it, uh, um, Larry Sabato's crystal ball, there was an aggregate data analysis that said that the money made no difference. <laughs> well, I mean, it's hard to say that the money made difference. The fact is there was vast amounts of money on both sides in all of these races. Right. So did the money make a difference? If any one of those candidates had stopped fundraising in July, okay. then the money would have made a difference. Right. So they it's like you said, it's an arms race. They both right. desperately need it. They're both making those calls to the richest people they know all day, every day. And, and that's, the, that's the sort of problem of 
who are they talking to? Who do they want to keep right. happy? Right. And also the problem with national aggregate data analysis is that it could affect unique elections in North Carolina, Iowa, et cetera, while nationally it gets washed out in the numbers. So you really did that. That analysis wasn't very, very compelling. What do you do? What do you do? Well, first of all, let, let's step back a second. What are we talking about when we talk about dark money and who's spending it? Right. So dark money is money that uh, is spent by organizations that don't disclose their donors. We use a definition that includes groups that don't disclose any of their donors or don't disclose at least some of their donors. Right. Um, so and these groups can have very bland names like Americans for a Better America. Americans for Prosperity. Right. Real and euphemistic you, stuff. And then you just don't know. It could be a special interest. I mean, it could be grassroots support. But it could be an oil company, it could be Wall Street, it could be unions, it could be environmentalists. You don't Coca-Cola, for example. Right. So then uh, if they spend a lot of money in favor of somebody, then maybe somebody owes somebody a favor and the voters don't know who that is and they can't make that elected. Right, favor. and if there's enough money and it's really negative, I mean, you both can destroy your opposition, but in a sense tear the fabric of the system. Right. I mean, look, disclosure is essential to the system. It's essential to voters when they see an ad, they want to know who's trying to convince them of something. Why is this person have an interest at stake? Uh, and, and then later, if, the, if that elected official goes on to engage in favoritism, they want to know where those relationships are. And dark money hides that. Okay. Who are these groups? They have 501 C4s, you know, a tax code designation by IRS. Right. What are they? So the, the, the tax code designations that they use were created 50, 60 right, years ago. Right, they're old. They're nonprofit forms that are, that are designed to better the community. You know, you want to open a food bank or these kinds of things. Um, the organizations now are using it basically for the sole reason that they don't have to disclose their donors. Um, the, the organizations that they're using are not supposed to spend on politics, or at least not supposed to spend primarily on politics. Um, but what we've seen is... Uh, there's little enforcement either from the FEC or IRS in terms of organizations that might be towing the line or going over the line. Let, let's just, just stop for a moment. Let me just digress. FEC, IRS. FEC has been toothless forever because of the, the, the partisan split, and the IRS has been incompetent, and when they do something, they screw it up. So you've got real enforcement problems and oversight problems. Yes, that's absolutely right. The current s structure that we have is problematic, and the IRS is actually looking at fixing the regulations so that the enforcement issue isn't such a big deal. Right now, we have very, f the regulations have this sort of fuzzy test. It's kind of a, I know it when I see it. It's right, politics. like pornography. Right. <laughs> so if, if, if the rules could be fixed and made clearer, then you wouldn't have you know, field agents in Ohio saying, I don't know, is, this, is, it, is it politics or isn't it? Um, and that, so that would improve the situation, and that process is underway, and hopefully we'll, we'll make things better. What else? What else is out there that might mitigate the extent and, and influence and then ultimately the corrupting power of this money? Right. Well, look, dark money, the problem with dark money is secrecy. So President Obama could issue an executive order today that would require all uh, entities that have contracts with the federal government to disclose... Yep to disclose their political contributions. He could do that right now. It doesn't need Congress to do that. Now, just an estimate, how much would it affect the flow of money? Well, it certainly wouldn't be all of the dark money. But no, but it's got to have some mitigating effect. I mean, there are massive, massive companies that do business with the I would government. think that the, the biggest of the spenders, the U.S. Chamber of Commerce, would declare war with the president of, over this one. <laughs> We've seen or that they've already already declared war on the press. Disclosure issues become very intensely uh, heated and partisan. This uh, this executive order was proposed and leaked uh, a few years ago and and hit and had s serious opposition. Uh, looking beyond the president, there's also the Securities and Exchange Commission, which regulates uh, public companies. It could require those companies to disclose their political activity, and that would presumably be a big piece of the pie in terms of uh, the dark money spending. Do they need legislative, legislative authorization that can all be done by executive man, uh, the, the, fiat? The, the SEC has the mandate to 
uh, protect investors and regulate public companies. And one of the ways, one of the primary ways they do that is through disclosure to say, if you're going to invest in this company, you need to know if they're engaging in risky activity. And political spending is inherently risky activity. So the SEC absolutely, as it stands right now, has the... And, and there's a petition before the agency that they're uh, working on. Okay. Well. Likelihood that the petition gets acted on? I have no idea. Has it, has it shown any inclination to do so in the past? You, you know, the, the, the petition was uh, on the agenda, and then the new chair came in, and it went off the agenda. We're not really sure why exactly that happened or what it means. Some um, kind of nefarious political deal, I'm sure. <laughs> no, no doubt. Um, but hopefully... Uh, you know, that, that process is still moving. The Federal Communications Commission, which regulates advertising, could also improve disclosure requirements uh, by itself without any uh, changes. in. So the executive, the president, could, if he so desired and had the political will to do it, make s substantial changes, if not determinative or dispositive changes, in the way at least government agencies oversee slash regulate this stuff. Right. I mean, some of these are independent agencies, just to, just to be lawyerly. That, that's but, true. That's yes, true. But, they could, that's but true. the point is they could do that stuff I without Congress. I take that Congress. back. Okay. Uh, yes. There's also Thank the Disclose Act in Congress, which, which would essentially eliminate dark money. Um, I don't have much hopes of the next Congress passing the Disclose Thanks. <laughs> thanks for that correction in terms of presidential power with independent agencies. Another source of disclosure, for example, is occurring in New York, with Tom DiNapoli, the, the New York state controller, who has forced several companies by the threat of withdrawal of pension funds for to disclose their political activities. So there's another avenue. Yes, that's absolutely right. You know, and that sort of complements the SEC effort, but there has been a lot of move of shareholder activism, which is what yep. Tom DiNapoli does because the pension fund invests massively in corporations. Uh, and there are, there's, more than 100 major corporations have voluntarily said, okay, we're going to disclose all our political spending or say that we you know, don't do it. But it, the, the problem with dark money appears less to be, again, given my limited experience with it, less to be corporate than individual billionaires, whether it's the Koch brothers or on the other side, Spire or whom, uh, Sheldon Alderson, et cetera, that it's a small number of very rich individuals. Now, they have corporations and they derive their wealth from it, but there's a little bit of difference there. Well, the, I mean, the main problem with dark money is we don't know. Yeah, that's true. Right. So right. it could be individuals. Right, they right. That's be. okay. Um, but, you know, one of the largest, it's either the number one or the number two dark money spender is the United States Chamber of Commerce, which counts as its members, companies, and That's corporations. True. That's so true. So it's reasonable to think that a lot of dark money does come from corporations. But, I mean, you're absolutely right. It, it could be that the vast majority of it comes from individuals. We just don't know. Okay. And then let, let's, let's, let's add a little bit of, you know, a little bit of nuance to this. We're talking about dark money from 501c4s. What about super PACs? What's that? It's confusing to us laymen <laughs> yes, out there. It's Dark money, 501c4s, super PAC. Mm -hmm. What's a super PAC? A super PAC is, so PAC means political action committee. Super PACs were essentially created as the after effect of Citizens United. Citizens United, right, said outside groups can spend as much as they want right. as long as they're independent. Right. So the, the FEC allowed this new form of group that does essentially that. It can take unlimited contributions and it can make unlimited expenditures as long as it doesn't coordinate with candidates. Uh, no, is there transparency in terms of donors? Yes. So super PACs are required to disclose all of their donors. The problem with that is they could disclose one of their donors could be a dark money group. So they say... Americans together, Super PAC, our sole donor who gave us $50 million last year was the Americans together C4, and we don't disclose who Money that like many. water finds its level. It, it, it always finds the weakest spot. Right, and that's another problem that would be fixed by the Disclose Act and could be fixed by Congress if they wanted to. Okay, that, let's, let's look at 16, and given your experience, where do you think this might go and where ought it go? <laughs> Uh, well, Let's answer the might go first. Right. I mean, the trend is clear. Outside sp spending is going up. Uh, outside spending is going up seems to be a bigger piece of, of the pie. And dark money is going up. Seems and and altogether money is exploding. Right. 
Right. So we can expect those trends to continue. We can expect 2016 to be by far the most expensive and the, and the least transparent election in American history. Um, where on it to go, you know, as, as we said, we talked about uh, uh, things that the president can do, things that the agencies can do, things that the Congress could do, although, you know, we don't expect that from the 114th Congress. Um, you know, this is, this is a slow motion scandal. I think it's going to keep getting worse and worse and people are going to keep getting more and more disgusted and there's going to have to be a turning point. So we have to suffer, <laughs> in a sense. No, I mean, the, the, the society, the, the civic society has to suffer enough until there's some kind of rebellion. But voters, I mean, where does the rebellion come from? Look, money in politics ha was more of an issue in this election than it has been in the past. You saw uh, there was a, a, an outside group, Mayday Pact, that was devoted to making this an issue. You saw candidates... But it wasn't an issue. an issue. I mean, well, do voters really care? I think... I think these were hard elections to okay. move the needle. Okay, on. I'm being too harsh. I'm sorry. Go ahead. <laughs> but but even the candidates were making an issue. You saw both sides saying, you know, you're an uh, agent of the Koch brothers and you're an agent of Tom Steyer, right? So the candidates even were talking about okay. big money calling okay. the shots. This okay. is a problem okay. that people respond to, okay. and people are concerned about. Right now, they just don't feel like anything can happen, and that's the lack of efficacy, the bump, the bump that we need to get over. <clears throat> Next time you talk to me, what, 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 do, you, what, what do you expect to say? <laughs> well, I hate to say I'll say all the same things, but I think it's, we're going to see the same but worse. And, okay. and, and I do think that this slow motion scandal, you know, we're going to hit some kind of tipping point, some kind of critical mass and say, this has got to stop. There's going to be a new, you know, reform in town. We've got to, we've got to change. And, but, it, it, but, but for that, we have to wait at least to 2016. Well... Right. I mean, look, the, the, there could be a case go up to the Supreme Court and the Supreme Court could change its mind. We could get a new uh, a vacancy on the Supreme Court and we could change the Supreme Court. Uh, you know, there are all. Yeah, well, I mean, right. I mean, that that five, four vote could could flip if it ha the vacancy happens with a Republican, quote unquote, uh, uh, justice. Will will a Republican Senate confirm any appointment from the president? That's, uh, there are people who are better placed to answer that question than I, but I, I think that, you know, this is one of the places where public pressure matters. Uh, you know, people care about this and they call their senators, then their senators care about this. It's not, it's not a we hope. conclusion. Okay. Thank you. Not, again, every time I talk to you, I'm not exactly optimistic when I finish the conversation, but thank you for your insights and your work. My, my thanks to Ian Vander Walker of the Brennan Center for helping us better evaluate the effect of money, particularly dark money, in the financing of political campaigns. For more information about the Brennan Center, go to brennancenter.org. See you next week when we revisit my conversation with a favorite author, Pete Hamill, here on CUNY TV. I'm Doug Musio. Let us know what you think about this show. You can reach us at cuny.tv. When you get there, click on the bar that says contact us and send your email. Whatever it is. Thanks, no thanks, obnoxious, do it. Send it.